Hello, my name is Hermela Mabratu. I am a senior public health and legal studies double major. And this past summer, I was given the opportunity to be a public policy intern at the American Gastroenterological Association through SBS in DC. The program taught me skills about professionalism, networking, and so much more. I'm very happy to welcome you to today's webinar. And today's session will be recorded and later added to our online video library of resources. By joining this session, you are giving consent to be a part of a recorded session. At the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A option available. Please feel free to post a question at any time during the session, and it will be sent to a meeting host. We hope to get as many of your questions as possible today. Participants' cameras and mics will be disabled during the webinar. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to now turn the webinar over to Dean John Hurd. Good evening, and I want to thank Carmela for those introductory announcements. My name is John Hurd. I'm Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences here at UMass Amherst, and I'd like to welcome you to our Social Science Matters webinar, American Health Policy in 2020, a pivotal year for change. Health is on the minds of everyone now as people around the world try to manage the impacts of the pandemic, as well as in the US where the upcoming election could have a significant impact on our healthcare system. Of course, calling US healthcare a system is a bit of a misnomer as it's really a hodgepodge of public and private insurance, government funded programs like Medicare and Medicaid and government provided healthcare such as through the Indian Health Service and through the military. We received scores of questions in advance from you, the audience, and the panelists specifically prepared their opening statements around those questions to address many of the overriding themes. During the Q&A, our moderator will ask a few more questions sent in advance that were not covered in the opening statements. I think it's fair to say this election cycle has been light on substance, certainly judging by the first debate, but I can tell from the questions submitting, submitted in advance that you are hungry for substantive engagement on these issues, so let's get to it. I'd like to introduce Jennifer Lundquist, Professor of Sociology and Senior Associate Dean of Research and Faculty Development in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, who will be moderating our panel today. Jen? Thank you, John, and welcome, everyone. I'll start by introducing our first panelist, who is Manas Vinny Singh. She's an Assistant Professor of Health Economics and Policy in the UMass Resource Economics Department. And her scholarship examines the interaction between decision theory and health policy, specifically on the ways in which organizational environments affect the ways in which physicians make decisions. Her findings on decision decision making actually were just recently cited in the New York Times. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I am going to share really quickly my slides. Great. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Manas Vinny, uh, Vinny, if you'd like, and I'm a health economist in the Department of Resource Economics. I'm excited and happy to be here to have a chance to talk about something that I love talking about. And this time, no one can accuse me of ruining a cocktail party. So let's get to it. Also, because I'm making jokes to a Zoom void is mildly unsettling. Uh, so the first question I'm going to discuss is something that's actually become a very common and popular piece of trivia in recent years. Uh, and that's the fact that American healthcare compared to other developed countries is much more expensive, but on average, much lower quality. There aren't enough books in the world to fill all the research on this topic, and it is a very complicated topic. No healthcare system is perfect, and the US healthcare system is far from the worst. But today, we are going to look at it uh, through a critical lens and look at where it fails and why. And we're going to talk about some of the issues ailing the American healthcare system. And while this is still very much an area of active research and discussion, I'm going to try to give you some of the most widely accepted explanations so far. Before we can get into the, all of it, I think it's important to start with um, how the US healthcare system is structured. Most of you may be familiar with this, but just in case, uh, there are three main players, the provider of care, which is hospitals, physicians, like others. Uh, there is the consumer of care, which is the patient. And then there is theoretically the assumer of risk, the insurer. 
patients go to the doctor uh, for care and buy health insurance from uh, the two main sources of insurance in the US, which is the government under Medicare or Medicaid and or private companies, um, which is most often tied to employment. And finally, this is important for the question of costs. Uh, the insurer pays the provider for the services the provider renders to the patient. The government, when they're the insurer, has pretty clear cut rules for how much they reimburse providers for care, but private companies each independently negotiate with the providers in their networks for how much they're willing to pay for the care. It is a complicated system and there are hundreds of researchers who've spent their lives studying each end of each of these eras. Okay, back to the question. Why is US healthcare expensive? In general, why are things expensive? They're expensive if you buy a lot of that thing, or they can be expensive if each individual thing has a really high price. So what is the case in US healthcare? According to a very large body of research, it appears to be that in the US it is the prices. Yes, the US system does spend, uh, does use a lot more of certain kinds of care, technology, imaging, etc. By and large, it isn't the amount of care they use, it is how high that care is priced. Now, why is that? To begin with, a big issue is consolidation of hospitals and physician groups. And by that, I mean mergers, acquisitions, MGH, buying Cooley, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's been several decades since providers have been collapsing into bigger and bigger healthcare systems. And why is that concerning? Remember when I mentioned that private companies negotiate with providers to settle on prices? So as providers consolidate, they increase their market power and therefore increase their negotiating power with insurers. The larger the provider group, the more the insurer wants the provider group to be in network so that they can have patients buy their plans. And the more the insurer wants the provider to be in network, the more the provider can charge for it. The general hope is that with consolidation, hospitals and physician groups exploit economies of scale and provide better care. And while that is certainly possible, there isn't a lot of evidence that that is occurring. Second reason, the actual costs of the inputs that go into providing or producing healthcare actually is higher in the US as well. The general administrative costs, that is costs that are not directly related to the provision of medical care are high. Turns out when you have a system as large and complicated as the American one, it gets very expensive to manage very quickly. And of course, uh, there's pharma. The US healthcare system largely does not regulate the prices of new drugs, uh, unlike other countries, which has an upside that it is a very lucrative market to, to get into drug development also has the downside that the, you know, it drives up the cost of drugs. There's the fact that physician salaries are also significantly higher than other countries, which in part reflects the fact that it's actually more costly to train a physician here, but also there are tight regulation that restricts the number of doctors that can be trained. I wanna be clear, none of this is unequivocally good or bad, but I have to be talking about these issues if we're discussing why prices are high as they are. Finally, prices are high because of a fundamental economics concept called uh, externalities. In the off chance you're not familiar, a classic example is smoking. If I buy cigarettes for $2, that $2 doesn't reflect the cost that I incur on society such, through things such as secondhand smoking. Thus, smoking has negative externalities in society. Similarly, not having uh, people insured properly also has serious negative externalities for society. When an uninsured person is hospitalized, they are essentially provided care at the expense of the system. Someone has to pay for that care and it often filters down all the way down to the consumer and manifests in increased premiums. The converse is that insurance has positive externalities too. People who have insurance get, for example, vaccines and preventative care like cancer screenings, which prevents things from getting worse and reaching a stage which is worse both from a health and cost perspective. Now, to the second part of the question. I covered why it's expensive, but why is the quality so low compared to other OECD countries? There's a very large literature led by the Dartmouth Atlas Research Group that shows that if I go to a hospital here today, I will probably get very different care from the care I get tomorrow or at another hospital 10, 10 miles down. 
from zip code to zip code, there's so much variation in care. There's actually a term for it. It's called variation in practice patterns. And what that ends up happening is because of this variation, there is unnecessary provision of care, there's under provision of care, and there is care that is not always in line with medical knowledge. Much of US healthcare, and the, sorry, the second reason is that much of US healthcare is actually reimbursed on a fee for service model, which means that um, physicians are reimbursed for the quantity of medical care provided instead of the quality. You do one test, you get $100. You do two tests, you get $200. You don't need to be an economist to see why that could cause issues. There is a move towards value-based payments, and that's a step in the right direction, but it's still very much a process. The third reason is that the US healthcare system is very fragmented, and there's a lack of coordination across all the sectors that need to coordinate to provide a high quality of care. So primary care specialists, social workers, lab testing companies, hospitals, insurers, government, clinical workers, there are so many players in the system and by and large, the onus of coordinating falls on the sick patient. What ends up happening is that patients fall through the cracks and care is not dispensed as needed. Finally, and this is similar to what we talked about already about the negative externalities uh, as a result of uneven coverage, uneven coverage also results in misaligned incentives for providers. Private companies reimburse at a higher rate than the government and the government and private companies both reimburse at a higher rate than no insurance at all. This results in there being strong incentives for hospitals and providers to favor providing care for insured patients and especially privately insured patients. These misaligned incentives result in uneven care across pockets of the population with serious disparities as Irene will talk about after me. Uh, that is a very quick and dirty summary of what ails the US healthcare system and though I could talk about it in greater detail. I'm going to move on to the second question in the interest of time. Uh, this question is actually as easy to answer as the first one was difficult. Uh, why have there been supply chain bottlenecks and shortages in healthcare during COVID and how can this be fixed? The answer is actually pretty simple. In this area of, in this era of uh, globalization, everything we use is made from supply chains that span multiple countries across the globe. With the pandemic being global, no country has been spread from the virus, which means that supply chains that end in countries, including the US, have suffered from this very sharp spike in demand. But what makes it worse? First, the US has suffered from a lack of a strong centralized government that could have mounted a unified national strategy for managing limited resources. The virus has not hit all states at the same time uh, or in the same way. and. Uh, this could have been used to our advantage. The states essentially started competing for resources, uh, which led to issues. And, and while state autonomy is very useful in many, many areas, this is a scenario that is custom made for a federal government to step in. To be clear, the administration did invoke one part of the Defense Production um, Act, which I think it's section 101, uh, which compels American companies to prioritize federal contracts and repurpose, it, repurpose manufacturing and supply chains to provide medical equipment. And while this is good, the question still remains whether it was done in time or whether it was done effectively. So the DPA is a multi-part law and some of its more relevant powers were not invoked, such as the lesser used allocation authority, which would have allowed the government to direct medical resources to parts of the country where it deemed most necessary. Another example is Statute 7, which would have allowed the government to turn a competitive private market into a cooperative one, and companies could have uh, brainstormed together, worked together to fix, fix bottlenecks without worrying about antitrust liability. Another thing is halting overseas operations of medical equipment, still a controversial use of the DPA, given that the US is and still will be relying on other countries for resources. In a nutshell, there's still a lot of scope for effective and efficient use of a very powerful tool. Uh, the second issue that there aren't enough incentives to provide innovative solutions to healthcare problems like limited PPE, bottlenecks, supply chains, etc. The most innovative tech goes to things like advertising, retail, blockbuster drugs because they bring in the big bucks, but manufacturing reusable PPE, for instance, not so much. As a result, necessary but not profitable innovation suffers. This is where the government could step in and be the buyer of such technologies and assume the risk in these innovations. 
then there's just the very obvious reason that we actually don't know why there are these bottlenecks because the data from these companies is just not available. And that can be solved by improving accountability and uh, greater transparency in manufacturing and logistics. Finally, I know this was a lot, the intricacies of healthcare get quite arcane and dreary very fast. So for those of you who've been to one of my talks before, you will know that I try to leave you with takeaways or a summary that is easy to digest, such as those in the form of a limerick. And here is my summary for you guys. Stressing a system already too busy, COVID made patients feel extra lay mizzy. There was a spike in demand and shit hit the fan, throwing this health system into a tizzy. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions um, afterwards. Stop sharing. Thank you so much. Um, and next, I have the pleasure of introducing Irene Martinez. She is an assistant professor of medical sociology in our School of Public, and Public Health and Health Sciences. Irene specializes in community-based participatory research, and she studies the socio-political arrangements that produce chronic disease disparities among Latinx immigrants and their US-born children. More recently, her research has examined the local implementation of immigration enforcement policies and the mental and physical health impacts that has on families with unauthorized immigrant members. Thank you for that introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my, my slides. All right, everyone, my presentation today will focus on contextualizing COVID-19 racial and ethnic health disparities with a focus on one of our most vulnerable populations, unauthorized immigrants. I want to end by recommending that our future healthcare reforms start from a health equity perspective or one in which we as a society produce conditions that allows everyone to have the opportunity to attain health, not just healthcare. From a health equity perspective, we strive for the absence of avoidable, unfair, and remediable differences across multiple lines, like race, class, gender, and immigrant status, among others. As we can see here on this slide, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed deeply rooted disparities in racial ethnic minority groups. For example, when we look at Hispanics or Latina, Latino, Latinx persons, they make up 30% of COVID-19 hospitalizations nationally, despite only being 18.5% of the U.S. population. Similarly, African-Americans make up 24.6% of hospitalizations, but only 13.4% of the U.S. population. Although the data are not shown here, 45% of children who have died from COVID-19 were Hispanic or Latinx, and 29% were Black and African or African-American. And this is also assuming that we have race and ethnicity data that they were collected at the time, either of the case being reported or the time that the person um, um, had passed. Examining COVID-19 cases and deaths in Native American populations who make up less than 2% of the US population, they bear many cases and deaths as well. Um, so here, Arizona, New Mexico, Wyoming have some of the largest proportions of um, Native Americans, but they account for the, a larger percentage of cases, and also in Arizona, a very large proportion of deaths. Okay, so if we look at Massachusetts cases and deaths, we see that uh, Blacks and Af African Americans and Hispanic Latinx populations likewise consist of a small percentage of the state's population. So here would be 7% for African American Blacks, or for uh, Hispanic Latinx populations, they only make up 12% of the population, but they have a larger proportion of the cases of COVID-19. And we have to think about this in the context that Massachusetts is actually one of the states with the lowest uninsured rates in the country. Okay, so there have been a few recent epidemiological studies that examine both county level and individual level um, factors that could predict COVID-19 cases. And they have largely found that obesity, uninsurance, employment status, immigration status, and limited English proficiency were the strongest predictors of COVID-19. Um, and so indicating that the social and economic conditions are better predictors for COVID-19 cases than underlying biological or cultural factors. So what are some structural inequalities that can help explain these disparities? 
Racial and ethnic minorities are highly impacted by structural factors, in other words, policies, institutional practices, and cultural representations that work together to develop and maintain social hierarchies along race and ethnicity, class, gender, nativity in the U.S. society. Two factors that shape um, communities of color exposure and healthcare access are residential and occupational segregation and the ways that immigration enforcement policies are passed alongside policies of deterrence. Segregation is not simply that a racial ethnic group is physically or geographically concentrated in one region by choice, but that institutional policies and practices, even private practices like lending, place people of color in areas that lack adequate material and environmental resources to promote health and economic development. In occupational segregation, people of color are relegated to low paying jobs with little to no benefits like health insurance, sick leave, um, and these jobs often have um, higher hazards and more exposures. Transmission of COVID-19 in communities of color is fueled by poverty and economic necessity. If we take a brief look at where racial ethnic minorities and immigrants work, we see that 33% of agricultural workers are Latinx, while more than a quarter of Latinx and Blacks African Americans work in service occupations, caregiving, home health aides, and house cleaning jobs are largely occupied by immigrant women and Latinx women in particular. And these are the frontline workers who have been helping us survive during the pandemic. Many people of color also live in areas like reservations or unincorporated areas along the US-Mexico border called colonias, which lack transportation and access to adequate and quality medical care services. Even if stay-at-home home orders were applied to many of these essential workers, many do not qualify for unemployment, especially if they're working in informal work arrangements, right, or if they're getting paid under the table. And many immigrants, not just those who are unauthorized, um, they did not receive federal stimulus checks. And it's also really hard for OSHA to have the capacity to enforce that employers provide personal protective equipment to mitigate COVID-19 exposures in many of these settings. So specifically, how has the pandemic impacted the health of immigrants? Um, so immigration enforcement policies, the work that I usually look at, are policies at the federal, state, and local levels meant to facilitate the identification, detention, and deportation of unauthorized immigrants in the United States. Immigration enforcement policies are often created in tandem with policies of deterrence, or those policies which limit access to healthcare and social services to unauthorized immigrants and immigrants who have not had permanent residency in the United States for five years or more. More importantly, Trump expanded the public charge rule to jeopardize visa and citizenship applications for immigrants who have received Medicaid and other publicly funded social programs like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or Food Stamps SNAP. This has created a chilling effect um, or fear and mistrust among immigrants or those with immigrant family members from, seek it, from seeking COVID-19 testing and treatment or related healthcare services. But people have to remember that when we deny unauthorized immigrants access to primary care or when we exclude them from household calculations for food stamps or cash welfare benefits, that that affects authorized immigrants and citizen children in these households. It's estimated that 16.7 million persons in the United States live with at least one unauthorized immigrant in their household, or what we call mixed status families. Of these 16.7 million people, 72% are citizen children. There are over now 330,000 people currently detained in ICE detention centers, and they're being exposed to COVID-19 because of the conditions that they're in. And they're generally not accepting adequate medical treatment when there isn't a pandemic let alone now, they, they're not receiving enough COVID-19 mitigation testing or treatment. Okay, um, so I'll end with a few immediate policy recommendations. Um, when the ACA was being drafted in 2009, President Obama and the Democrats strongly asserted that it would not extend coverage to unauthorized immigrants. So this was done to appease segments of the U.S. population and many Republican members of Congress, like Representative Joe Wilson, who yelled out, liar to President Obama as he was addressing Congress in 2009. However, unauthorized immigrants do not have healthcare access because of the many reasons that I just discussed. So if our next round of healthcare reforms move towards a single payer system, 
um, I hope that it's not, that it also is one that's grounded in racial and health equity, that we extend access to care, not just in the form of health insurance, but one that recognizes that informal workers and service workers in our society, regardless of their nativity or their racial or ethnic position, sustain our society. The recommendations that I have here to universally cover COVID-19 testing and treatment, reverse the public charge rule, provide protections to non-medical essential workers, releasing ICE detainees, and extending medical care in carceral and detention settings would not only help racial and ethnic minorities or immigrant populations, but also the U.S. at large. I welcome your questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks so much, Irene. And now I am pleased to introduce Bob Pullen, Distinguished University Professor of Economics and Co-Director of the Political Economy Research Institute. Bob's current areas of research include the economics of climate change and sustainable growth. In fact, he just published the book, Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal with Noam Chomsky. But relevant to today's panel, he also studies the economics of single-payer healthcare in the United States and co-authored a 2018 book entitled the Economic Analysis of Medicare for All. He has consulted with, among others, the California Nurses Association, Senator Bernie Sanders, and Representative Jayapal on designing single-payer healthcare systems at both the state level for California and on a national scale. Bob? Hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm really enjoying hearing uh, Professor Singh and Martinez, and I think what I'm going to talk about is very much in alignment with what you've already heard, but I'm gonna address one specific question that was posed to me, which is this, is public universal healthcare a real possibility in the United States? Is it realistic to expect that costs can be reduced while improving quality and universalizing access? Okay, so I'll start with a basic answer, and the basic answer is yes. <laughs> Yes, it is realistic to expect that costs can be reduced while improving quality and universalizing access. And in fact, it's actually not a very, very difficult conclusion to have to defend. In fact, it's rather easy uh, once we look at the body of evidence. And in my own research, and thank you, Jen, for mentioning my work on Medicare for All, uh, basically, the, the thing that we uh, did, my co-authors and I, was really just review, uh, first of all, the evidence from other countries that all operate with various forms of universal coverage, and then also the evidence from the United States on what we know about ways through which we can uh, lower costs and extend care. And so it's really just a matter of putting those things together. Uh, Medicare for All is a system through which we can provide universal coverage and save money. And let me give you some basics on it. Okay, so the United States at present uh, spends about $3.3 trillion on healthcare. Uh, that's a gigantic number, but let me break it down. Uh, it amounts to about 17% of all economic activity in the economy, uh, GDP. So it's a little bit less than one fifth of every dollar spent in the US economy is spent in some way on healthcare. Another way of measuring uh, the cost is in terms of cost per person. And if we take an average, it comes out in round numbers to about $10,000 per person. Now we just heard Professor Martinez talk about massive uh, disparities and access to care, and that's critical to keep in mind, but it's also useful to have this average figure in front of us. So we spend about $10,000 per person, about 17% of GDP. Now, how does this compare with other countries at comparable levels of uh, development, uh, high income countries, all of which operate with some form of universal coverage? And I'm thinking now about Germany, France, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Spain, and Italy, here are the comparable numbers. Those countries spend on average between nine and 11% of GDP. Remember I said we spend 17%. That difference between spending say nine and 11% versus in the United States spending 17% are 
amounts to about $1.3 trillion, $1.3 trillion in today's economy. So effectively, when I say, well, can we afford a cheaper system? We're spending $1.3 trillion more than what comparable countries are spending uh, proportional to the size of their economies. The other way of measuring it, uh, these other countries, again, Germany, France, UK, Canada, Australia, Spain, Italy, spend between $3,400 and $5,700 per person. So roughly $3,500 to $6,000 per person, while we in the United States, again, are spending $10,000 per person. Now, uh, given that we are spending uh, uh, dramatically more than these other comparable countries, what happens in terms of outcomes? Professor Singh made some reference to that, and let me just be a little more specific as it relates to the questions at hand. Uh, one uh, standard measure, uh, an aggregated measure of health outcomes in uh, countries is something called amenable mortality rates. Uh, amenable mortality rates is a fancy way of talking about uh, deaths that are preventable by treatment. So deaths preventable by treatment. And countries ha have been ranked uh, according to this measure, according to deaths preventable by treatment. The United States ranks 34th. The United States ranks 34th, even though we spend dramatically more, dramatically more in terms of the overall economy and per person than all the other countries that are spending far less and getting significantly better overall outcomes. Okay, now why are we operating a system that is, we are spending so much money on and getting inferior outcomes? How is it possible that you can spend that much more money 50, 60% more than comparable countries and getting dramatically inferior outcomes. Now, one of the biggest factors, not the only one, and Professor Singh alluded to a range of them, but I will focus on one. Of the, the, the problem with uh, insurance coverage, that is in the United States uh, today, and I literally just was checking some data as of today to make sure I hadn't missed anything. Uh, as of today, roughly speaking, 28 million people, uh, a little less than 9% of the population are uninsured. There are people that do not have any insurance coverage. Uh, and in addition to that 28 million people, 9% of the population, we have another over 100 million people, 104 million people, 32% of the population that we could call underinsured. And what do I mean by underinsured? Underinsured refers to people who actually do have insurance. They are carrying insurance. Okay, but even though they're carrying insurance, they're unable to access medical care because their deductibles or copays are prohibitively high. And so that these people are people who do not do, uh, according to survey evidence by the Commonwealth Fund, uh, do, don't do one of four things. They don't get prescriptions filled that they need. They skip recommended tests, treatments, or follow-ups. They had a medical problem but did not go visit a provider. Or they are recommended to see a specialist and they don't go. Uh, all of this for people who have coverage, okay? Uh, and we can think of some examples. Uh, many of you uh, remember, I'm sure, the case of uh, July 2018 of the woman in Boston who was getting off the subway in Boston and whose leg was trapped. Her leg got trapped between the subway platform and the train and was in excruciating pain and was at fear of death. And she was actually rescued by uh, other people on the platform that pulled her off, but her leg was in terrible shape. And what was the first thing she said when she realized she was gonna survive this horrible accident. Please do not call an ambulance. Please do not call an ambulance because I cannot afford an ambulance. And she had insurance. The cost of the ambulance, the average in Boston at that time was between $1,200 and $1,900. So what we have between the uninsured and the underinsured, we're looking at 
132 million people, nearly 40% of the population. And these people are the ones that are contributing to the very poor outcome because they are not getting the care that they uh, require. Now, okay, so uh, what do we do about it? Well, the simple thing to do about it is develop a system of universal care, that everybody has good access to care. And it's also the case, and I, I may get to this more in the Q&A, uh, that of the 60% that do have coverage, a very high proportion of those uh, have it through employers, and so that their health care is contingent on their retaining employment. And as we've seen over the last six months, over 40 million people have gone on unemployment insurance at any given time. I'll save that for the Q&A, uh, but just keep that as a, as a uh, thought. Okay, what would happen if we introduced uh, Medicare for All, universal coverage? Um, uh, so let me just summarize briefly what my research and that of my co-authors has come up with. Um, Number one, we would get uh, people getting more treatment. People would go see providers more than they are now. As, as we just said, uh, you know, roughly 30% of the population has insurance and still isn't going to get the care they need. Under Medicare for All, everybody has access to care and it is affordable. Nobody is actually paying anything other than through the insurance system. And uh, so what would happen? Uh, would it be the case that the costs of the system would explode? Well, going through the research on this, what, uh, and I have a high end estimate. My estimate is that the overall cost of the system would go up by 12%. Overall, everybody gets covered, including the 40% that are uninsured and underinsured. Overall costs increase by 12%. So does that mean that Medicare for all is gonna increase our share of spending relative to GDP? No, because the other thing that happens when you introduce Medicare for all is you introduce uh, major sources of cost savings. Uh, and Professor Singh, uh, again, discussed some of these. I'm gonna focus on two. Uh, the two biggest sources of cost savings that would in and of themselves uh, generate almost about 16% of cost savings relative to our existing system are one, administrative simplification, uh, meaning that instead of having this uh, uh, labyrinthine system that Professor Singh was talking about in terms of the insurance provision, in terms of the coverage, in terms of uh, the re relationships between providers various multiple payers, insurance companies, and the government, you simplify it, you have one system, and according to my estimates, which I would again say are conservative, overall system costs will fall by 9%. Overall system costs fall by 9%. Remember, we have a $3.3 .3 trillion system, so we're talking about saving $300 billion per year, thereabouts. Uh, the second one is reducing prescription drug prices. If you look at the comparable other countries, they are paying 50, 60% less for the exact same basket of prescription drugs. It's not that they're getting inferior quality drugs. It's not that they're getting fewer drugs. As Professor Singh said, with respect to prices, they're just paying less. They're paying less, 50 to 60% less. So in our research, we assumed conservatively that uh, we would, in the United States, would save 40%, not 50%, not 60%. We'd save 40% on prescription drugs. And there are other sources, uh, smaller sources of savings. You add that all up, basically what our research has found is that you can operate Medicare for all with good quality coverage for everybody and still operate the system at about 9% less than what we pay now for overall medical care. And again, that's a conservative estimate because under that estimate, uh, the US as a share of GDP would still end up paying about 15.8% of GDP, not 17, not 18%, 15.8%, uh, but that would be 
the result. We would have a system that operates cheap, more cheaply. Everybody is covered. It's a more egalitarian system, and it's a system that delivers better care at lower cost. So I'll end there. Thanks everyone so much for sharing your remarks and there have been some questions that have been coming in um, when the panelists have a chance as they're kind of listening to each other and reading remarks, etc. They're also writing in some um, responses. I also want to note that we received scores of questions from the audience that have been sent in advance. Many were answered in the, in the talks that were just given, but there are a few interesting ones that have not yet been addressed. Um, so I will ask at least one of those, each of the panelists, and then I want to get to um, a couple of very interesting ones that have, have just come in here too in the live chat. Um, so let's see here. Um, I'm going to address this question at Vinny. It's a big question, and so I encourage the other panelists to uh, jump in and um, share your uh, responses to the question as well. And the question is, if you were to create the structure for healthcare delivery and reimbursement today from scratch, what would it look like? And you have two minutes to answer this question. Um, that is a big question. And I'm going to stay away from the biggest answer, which is what kind of healthcare system would, would need to, we would need to sort of design the sort of uh, reimbursement delivery and focus on like smaller things that we can do even right now. Um, so one thing is make physicians, patients, and insurers uh, take risk on for the care they're providing, but only for things that can influence. Uh, second would be sort of move towards a value-based reimbursement system, which is currently happening. Uh, but what that looks like is still very much up in the air. Is it? Uh, and for those who don't know what value-based payment is like, uh, physicians get paid not, you know, by the number of services they provide or even like a fixed rate, they get paid for actually improving health. And of course that comes with its own challenges. What is improving health? How can one do this? Uh, how to not distort incentives and ha have people choose healthier patients? Um, things like that still need to be worked out, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Uh, Another thing about reimbursement would be just, it'd be nice to have one bill. Um, I don't know if, if you guys, if you've ever been to an inpatient stay, uh, you get bills all the time. It gave me so much stress, especially as a student, to be getting different calls from different people and thinking that I had paid something off and then there's surprise billing. Uh, all of these issues uh, can be solved like one at a time. Um, they will. They can be solved with larger policy efforts um, as well. But that is a question for another day. If we're talking about so that was reimbursement. Uh, if we're talking about what good delivery of healthcare system looks like, um, right now the system is built for measuring billing. Uh, it should be measure. It should be built for measuring clinical excellence. Like even the electronic health records right now are. Um, tracking how best to bill patients. It would be nice if the data we collect actually helps patients get better. Um, and I have lots of other thoughts, but I think I'm running out of time. Does anyone else want to weigh in on this? Okay, I am going to um, move to a question that ha has just come in uh, that relates uh, to what each of you have spoken about, um, but ask some specific questions. Um, and these two questions are, are somewhat related. So uh, Matt Collins writes, Massachusetts has 97% of its citizens covered by insurance, yet we still have the same cost quality challenges. What else might be at play beyond uninsured, uninsured claims costs that is driving the cost? Might it be the unmitigated supply of healthcare services? And relatedly, while you're thinking about that, he also asks, if one believes that oversupply of healthcare services drives demand, how would a single payer system address that concept favorably? So 
sorry. Um, would any of the panelists like to respond to that, any, either of those questions? I can reread them. And Bob, I think you're muted. Okay, how's that? Perfect. Um, yeah, so the, the problem of oversupply, you know, there's another term for it called physician-induced demand, uh, meaning that as Professor Sane was talking about, uh, in a, in a fee-for-service system, uh, it's an incentive there, you know, for the, the providers to keep prescribing things because they get uh, more fees as a result of that. So <coughs> uh, within a uh, single payer Medicare for All system, um, you could still operate Medicare for All uh, with a uh, uh, fee-for-service system uh, in principle, but that would be a, bad, a very bad idea. So what we want to have under uh, Medicare for All, and we could also introduce it um, within our existing system, but it would be more fragmented, uh, would be some kind of um, universal budgeting. That is, you uh, at some level of the healthcare system, at the level of regions, at the level of states, you actually just have an overall budget. The budget can be determined on the basis of costs in previous years. The bigger uh, the pool of people you have uh, within your, uh, your, your budgetary framework, uh, it's easier to predict what the overall costs are gonna be. And so that within an overall cost budgeting framework, then um, there is no longer this incentive uh, to over provide because the money won't be there. And so that there is a, a much greater incentive to then uh, uh, prioritize and to also introduce things that will uh, enable cost savings such as preventive care. Okay, and just so the panelists, oops. so the panelists are, you can just unmute yourself and uh, put your video or your video is on and speak whenever you want. I'm going to move on to the next question unless you want to uh, add something to that. Vinny. I, uh, sorry, quick thing. I, I don't want to add uh, anything to what Bob said, but uh, there are a lot of questions in the chat that um, have the exact same theme of won't Medicare for all do X horrible thing. Um, and I just want to say that that is a common misconception uh, that Medicare for all and a, and a robust private market are exclusive to each other. Uh, they, there are countries where these coexist and honestly the type of universal healthcare system the United States will choose um, will, will ultimately decide how things turn out for in, in, in reference to a lot of these questions regarding drugs and uh, salaries of nurses and doctors and things like that. So just, it's not a blanket. There's not one model. So um, yeah, just a note. Okay, thanks. I wanted to direct a question at Irene that had come in. And this question is, is there a way to track or accurately estimate the COVID-19 infection rates for undocumented people? The questioner had asked specifically about East Boston, Irene, but maybe you could also talk about this on a, a national level. Yeah, so my first response to this is why do you want to collect data on unauthorized immigrants or why do you need to know this specific, um, this specific variable, right, or this characteristic of the patient population or the persons who are infected with COVID-19? And the reason why I ask this is because oftentimes this, like when we think about the history of pandemics, often xenophobic like narratives have been built around people who are immigrants right or refugees and so we want to be really careful about why we're collecting this data like we don't want to continue to stigmatize a population that's already very vulnerable um but on that being said i mean for someone like myself who does examine like what are the consequences of being an unauthorized immigrant in the u.s and to u.s citizens um to u.s citizens who are part of mixed status families um, there are ways that you can deduce this information without asking the question directly. And my fear is that if you ask this question directly of people when they're being tested for COVID-19 or seeking health services, 
um, during this time is that because of the public charge rule, people are gonna be afraid and they're not gonna seek health services. Um, so one of the ways that we could maybe deduce this without asking people directly is first just even, I think even having information about someone's nativity or where their, you know, their country of origin would be, I think, useful demographic information. But one of the other ways that you can deduce this is that if someone has, doesn't have health insurance, right, but they have, you know, they're eligible based on their income and the number of people in their household, you know, maybe it's related to their um, immigration status. The other thing is that, so in different states, they do this differently, but I know in Massachusetts um, and in the previous state that I was in, in Arizona, they don't allow unauthorized immigrants to have access to driver's licenses. So if you have that information, it often means like, and they're, you know, of course, above the age of, of driving. Um, if they don't have a driver's license, that's often used as a proxy too. And then, so for um, demographic research centers like Pew, um, they have a series of questions that they go through, even using census data to find out or to discern whether someone is unauthorized and not, or not. So one is like country of origin. Um, the other is an interesting question, whether or not people qualify to work as state or federal employees. Um, and so that's maybe one way, but I just first ask people, why is this data important for you and how are you going to use it? And if you do collect um, data about someone's immigration status, how can you ensure to the population that you're collecting it from or that, you know, that community that you're not going to share that information with ICE or government agencies, right? Because if people are afraid of, of even asking for help or, you know, so even we know this in mixed status household research that when, um, when the parent, one, one of the parents is unauthorized and the children are U.S. citizens, the family will not seek even benefits that their children are eligible for. Um, they often don't because they're afraid that this will bring any that this will tarnish their immigration applications later. And now with the with the expansion of the public charge rule to include Medicaid and SNAP, I mean, people are less likely to um, to seek those services. Um, and then I guess if you're thinking about in terms of contact tracers, um, of course, it's obvious you have to have contact tra tracers who speak the language of um, of migrant populations or migrant communities. Right, and there has to be some reassurance to them that that them sharing information about where they've been and the people that they've come into contact with that they're, you know, that they're not in danger that they're not going to report this information to either local law enforcement or immigration enforcement. I hope I answered your question. Thanks, Irene. And now I'm going to direct this question at Bob, but again, other panelists, please weigh in. Um, how about a counterintuitive perspective? What are some reasons to not support universal health care? Um, well, I guess it depends on exactly what we mean. Uh, are we talking about a Medicare for all or a private universal system? But let me just take it broadly. I mean, the, the, the most principled reason would be to say, you know, we don't want government interfering with uh, this, such important things in people's lives. Let people decide on their own. That would be consistent with a laissez-faire, free to choose, free market approach. You know, if you wanna spend money on healthcare, you decide how much to spend. You shouldn't have the government telling you how much you need to pay. Uh, you shouldn't have the government insisting that you be insured. Um, and that fees and so forth between providers and, uh, and patients and hospitals would all get sorted out in that way. Uh, that would be, uh, I would say, kind of the most principled argument. Uh, then the a second argument, and so this one is, would be more persuasive, at least to me, is to say, well, look, uh, and I've, I've actually been in touch recently with uh, people I know who do work in this area in Canada and the U United Kingdom, Great Britain, both of which, by the standards of the United States, are you know single payer systems that have been highly successful. They are among the ones that spend a lot less money and have better outcomes. But in those countries, they are being faced with cost-cutting measures. And so that once you are in a country where you, okay, you have a single-payer system, but then you have uh, a recession uh, and you have a government that is not committed to egalitarian outcomes, then we just start chopping up 
the uh, single payer system and it works less and less effectively. And so uh, the, you know, the only way to protect, there's only two ways to protect against that is to, uh, is to fight in behalf of the system. The other way is the fallback say, well, okay, you know what? We, don't, we can never really maintain this system, so let's not operate a single payer system because it is always going to get attacked politically, especially in economic hard times when budgets are tight. And I would just mention finally on that, uh, one of the things that's happened in the last six months with COVID is that people who have lost their jobs um, have moved to a very considerable extent onto Medicaid. They did, it's not that they all went on no insurance, they lost their employer-based insurance, went on Medicaid. Now here's the problem with Medicaid. One of the problems is that it is financed to a large extent by state governments and state governments, as we know, are running out of money. Okay, thanks, Bob. This is a question and this will be our final question since we're approaching the witching hour. And that is uh, for all panelists to, to weigh in on or whoever gets to it first. How will the experience of COVID impact public opinion toward universal health care? Uh, well, I just talked, but I'll be happy to start. Uh, very, very briefly. Um, I think the experience with COVID, referring to what I just said, tells us how critical it is that there be universal coverage because people, 150 million people are covered by employer-based care. Uh, 40 million people have gone on unemployment insurance. And not all of them, as I said, not all of them uh, are uninsured now, but they moved into Medicare. So it's it just a, makes a, an even bigger mess. And then people uh, in this situation are also afraid to get treated for COVID because they can't afford it. So uh, uh, this pandemic becomes another basis for people facing the terror of uh, financial ruin as a result of a healthcare pandemic that you know they had no control over. I would say the same uh, with maybe one caveat, which is um, the, the COVID, Yes, that will happen, but that also depends on how much power the people who have been most affected by COVID have in this whole scenario. Um, given that there have been really massive inequalities in the way COVID has affected the employment and the health outcomes of various segments of the American population, and given that those are strongly correlated with um, voting power or uh, influ influence on voting um, outcomes uh, that it, 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 I think it should move public opinion towards a more po positive view of universal health care, but it will also probably make a lot of people realize um, that uh, wealth gets you uh, quite far uh, and even more insulated from even something like a pandemic than before. I would hope that people think that universal health care is more important now during the pandemic, but I think what were the latest numbers that it's only still a little over 50% of the people are, are um, there for a single payer system. So, and I think that those numbers are very much generational, like there's an age difference between people who, like it's younger people who are usually for the single payer system or a national health care system. So I think that they're also, um, I don't know. There was a question in the in one of the chats about how we how we talk about this. How do we share this knowledge with politicians? But I think part of the issue is just the way that even the the single payer um, like the single payer model is being framed. Like whether it was ACA time in two thousand nine or now, it's like when people frame it in the language of socialized medicine, or when people you know when they don't distinguish like what a single payer system could mean and what universal coverage could mean versus you know. A socialized system where you know even the way that doctors give care is controlled right so people need to yeah i think part of the problem is that we don't disseminate our own research into more you know into into lay um, media platforms or we don't communicate this language back to communities that are most affected so that's kind of 
I feel like this would help change people's mind or inform them better about what would it look like if we did have a single payer system. Um, yeah, and that it wouldn't cost them more, that they'd have choice. So the things that, 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 uh, that pe why, we, why people don't want to don't wanna change into a single payer system. Thanks, that was, that was really terrific. I wanna thank professors Martinez, Poland, and Singh for your ex expert observations and for sharing your time with us today. Thank you, Jen, for moderating this event. And of course, thank you to all the participants for tuning in. And thanks to the people behind the scenes that make this look easy. And believe me, it isn't. Sally Fitz, Salo De Paula, and Stephanie Suba. I hope you can join us for future events on this and other important topics. Take good care, stay well, and vote. Good evening, everyone.